Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night Parashat Shavua class. We're happy you can join us this evening here on a, another winter night studying Torah. Happy that you are here live online and those listening on our podcast and the recording. Thank you for joining us. FindingHoliness.com, FindingHoliness.Busprout.com. Um, lots of different shiurim there for your liking and um, it's all there archived for you. Thank you to everyone who has um, supported the Shi'ur, who has supported the podcast. Tonight's Shi'ur is dedicated and sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Elias Azulai in memory of his brother, Mr. Ayush Azulai Zichron Ibracha, and as well as Mr. and Mrs. Jack Ben Kesus in memory of his uncle, Mr. Mokhluf Ruach Zichron Ibracha, Tinaf Sham Tura Bitsura Haim, May the words of Torah that we say this evening be le'ailui nishmatam. Amen. Again, holiness matters. That is why we are here. This week's parasha is Parashat Beshalach, also known as Shabbat Shira, an auspicious weekend. It is a Shabbat that you want to make every effort to attend Bet Knesset. I know difficult with the circumstances that surround us. But it's time to push that all away and come to Bet Knesset to hear the Shira that will be read. The Az Yashir Moshe Shirat Hayam. Achachamim tell us that there are so many segulot that are, are found in within the Shira. That's the reason why we say it every single day in our Shahri prayer. Um, probably the biggest one is that a person can find his Zivug, person that is looking to find his soulmate, a person that hears Shirat Hayam, who says it with Kavana as well, is a Segula to find the Zivug. And those that already have the Zivug, those that are already married and found their soulmate, is a, a, an opportunity to increase and better that relationship with proper Kavana of Shirat Hayam. Because we know HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts Ish ve Isha together, and the Chachamim tell us that that's something very difficult for God. It was something that um, that is as difficult as splitting the sea, and hence the connection between Kiryat Yamsuf and Zivug. So Shabbat Shira, because Parashat Peshalach contains the holy song of Moshe Rabbeinu and Bnei Israel as they sang to commemorate the miracle of Kiryat Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. I'd like to focus tonight on one aspect of this historical event but more of something that takes place at the end of Kiryat Yamsuf, after the song, something that gets overlooked and overshadowed a little bit. You know, a lot of the events in the parasha lead up to the splitting of the sea, and then you got the song, and then you got the parasha of the man, and then the end of the parasha concludes with the war of Amalek. However, somewhere in the middle, embedded within all this, is another song, that was sang by the women, the women led by Miriam Hanevia, they did not join the men in singing their own shira. Instead, they chanted a song of their own. The Torah describes at the conclusion of Shira Tayam the following Pesukim. I read them for you. Vatikach Miriam Hanevia Ahot Aharon. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aharon took etatof beyada. She took the tambourine in her hand. But tesena kol anashim achareya, and all the women followed her betupim ubim cholot with tambourines and with dances. But an laem Miriam, Miriam called out to them, Shiru la donai ki gaol gaa, sing to Hashem for his he is exalted above the arrogant. Sus verochevo ramavayam having hurled the horse with its rider into the sea. Of course, this last line is very, very similar to what Moshe Rabbeinu sang. In essence, that's the song. It's very interesting that the women chose to celebrate more exuberantly than the men. 
not only did they sing, but they danced, and they danced with instruments, with tambourines, hence the title of tonight's shiur, Miriam, the tambourine woman. Rashi brings down in the name of the Mechilta that the righteous women of that generation were so certain that God was going to perform miracles for them when they were redeemed, that they took tambourines out of Egypt. Unbelievable level of emunah, a little more than the men. The men didn't take out their instruments, the women did. I'd like to shed some light tonight on this comment by Rashi. First of all, where do we find that Miriam even prophesied? Where do we find that she prophesies? Why is she called a prophetess in the Pasuk when she was only the Aharon sister? Ahot Aharon, before Moshe was born, Chachamim tell us that she said that my mother, Yocheved, is destined to give birth to a son. And that son was going to be the savior of Israel. And hence, that's the, the prophecy that she received. The order of the prophecies listed and described in detail in, in Masechet Sota, Dafyud Bet Amud Bet. I read for you the Gemara. Batikach Miriam Neviyah Achot Aharon. The Gemara asks, Achot Aharon velo Achot Moshe? Was she this just the sister of Aharon and not the sister of Moshe? Why does the Torah describe her as a sister of Aharon? Amarav 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 ve'amri lar Amarav Nachma Amarav melamed to teach us she'ayta mitnabea kesheyi Achot Aharon. The reason why she's called the sister of Aharon is because she had prophecy when she was only the sister of Aharon, and not that of Moshe, because Moshe wasn't born yet. Miriam was the eldest of the three, and Aharon was the younger brother, was the second brother, and Moshe was the third brother. Omeret, she would say, ben Israel. She said, in the future, my mother is going to give birth to the Savior of the Jewish people. When Moshe Rabbeinu was born, the entire house turned into light. Amad Avia Unchaka al Rosha. His father, her father, Amram, saw this and gave her a big bezel, a big kiss. Uh, bijou, bijou, right? That's how you say uh, in French, I believe. Uh, on, on her head. Amar la, he said to her, Biti, nitkaima nevuataich. My daughter, your, your nevua is, has been fulfilled. Here's our son, Moshe, is going to save the Jewish people. But when Paro de, de announced that all the babies need to be thrown in the river, all of a sudden her father went from a state of happiness to a state of uh, Moroccan anger. Ahmad Avia Utfahad Rosha. Her father gave her a nice a nice slap on her head. Where is your prophecy? What happened to your prophecy? We have, to, we have to kill our son. We have to throw the babies in the river. This is the meaning of what the Torah tells us in Parashat Shemot. That Miriam was standing in the river looking to know what was going to happen to her brother Moshe what was going to happen with her prophecy, whether or not it was going to be fulfilled or not. And this is the prophecy that she had. And she was only the sister of Aharon at that, uh, at that time. We still need to figure out why the Torah chose to describe Miriam's nevuah as the prophecy of Aharon's sister, um, even though, yes, she was only Aharon's sister at the time, it probably would have been more fitting to allude to this Nevoah as being Miriam and Neviah, the sister of Moshe. Uh, at this time, Moshe Rabbein was the leader. He is the one in charge. He's the one who just sang the song. He led the Jewish people through the Yam Suf. At this time, uh, you, uh, how, who's going to recognize Miriam? You, re you recognize her because she's a sister of Moshe Rabbeinu. So why is Aharon even mentioned in this context? In this context now of Shirat Ayam, why was there a need to even mention Aharon? Maybe we can provide some answers by explaining first why Miriam merited to have this revelation, that her 
mother was going to give birth to a son who would save Israel. That same Gemara also describes something that I want to read for you. The Pasuk in Parashat Shemot says, Vayelech ish mi bet Levi, that a man from Levi went, Vayikach et bat Levi, and he went and he took a daughter of Levi. Lehechan alach, the Gemara says, where did he go? The, the Torah didn't tell us where Amram went, it's just where he went. Amar of Yehuda bar Zvina, she'alach ba'atzat bito. He went with the advice of his daughter, his daughter Miriam. Tana, it was taught, this is all the Gemara, Amram gadol ador haya. Amram was the leader of the generation. Kevan shegazar paro harasha kol ben ha'ilod ha'orat hashichu. Since Paro decreed that all the baby boys were to be thrown in the Nile, Amar, he said, What's the purpose of getting married? We're getting married for no reason. To have children to be killed? Amad ishto. So Amram said, I'm taking action. Yocheved, here's your get. Have a good life. Be well. Nice knowing you. And he divorced his wife, Yocheved. Amdu kulan Everybody else, following what the rabbi did, because Amram was the rabbi. He was the leader of the generation. So they all divorced their wives. All of them gave him gitin. Amra lo bito, his daughter told him, daughter was five, five years old at this time. Unbelievable. Tells his father, tells her father, Abba, kasha gezeratecha yoter mishel paro. Your decree is greater than paro's decree. She paro lo gazar el ala zecharim. Paro only decreed upon the males that they should die. Ve'ata gazarta ala zecharim ve'ala nekevot. You are decreeing by by separating from your wife, divorcing your wife, and hence ceasing to have children. You are your decrees worse because now you're not, not only not having boys, no girls either. Amad ishto. So he went back and he remarried his wife Yocheved. and everybody else also remarried their wives, and that's the meaning of Vayelech Ishmi Bet Levi. He went with the advice of of his daughter. So based on this famous passage, we can suggest that that's the reason why Miriam merited the Nebuah. My mother is destined to give birth to a son who will save the Jewish people. It was that so her father Amram would take his wife back. She argued convincingly that there was no reason to fear for Paro's decree, meaning drowning Israel, male newborns in the Nile, because she foresaw that her mother was going to give birth to a savior. And as a result of that prophecy, all of the Jewish men returned to their wives. How did Amram know that his daughter's nevuah was legitimate? She was only five years old. Five, my five-year-old comes and tells me something like that. I'm saying, yeah, very nice, uh, very nice, sweetie. I'm glad you think of that. But you, you probably wouldn't give it much more thought than uh, five seconds or so. How did he know that it was legitimate? The Zohar writes, Vayelech ish da Amram. This man is Amram. He went and took the daughter of Levi, who was Yocheved. A heavenly voice came down and instructed him to be with her, to be intimate with her. Because the time of the Geula for Israel came by the means of a son that was going to be born and produced by this um, this cohabitation, and Hakadosh Baruch Hu assisted in the matter. So there was a bat call that took place. It came down to Amram, and Amram heard this heavenly voice, which supported Miriam's nevia, uh, nevuah, her prophecy. Why did the pasuk? Let's go back to our question. Why did the pasuk insist to call Miriam as Achot Aharon, as a sister of Aharon? The Mishnah in Perkei Avot tells us very famously in the first chapter, Hilel Omer, Heve mi talmidav shel Aharon. We should be, or learn to be, among the disciples of Aaron HaKohen, who was Ohev Shalom verodev Shalom, a man who loved peace and promoted peace. Not only did Aharon strive to promote peace between his friends, but the Midrashim tell us that he also promoted peace between spouses. And we know this, when Aharon HaKohen passed away later on in Sefer Bamidbar, the Torah tells us, The entire assembly saw that Aharon died. They cried and wept for Aharon 30 days, the entire house of Israel. 
And Rashi here says, men and women, everyone grieved over Aharon's death. Why? Because he was the ultimate peacemaker. He promoted shalom and amity among all those who were fighting and bickering and disputing with each other, including husbands and wives. So we already learned that Miriam prophesied that her mother was destined to give birth to a savior of, of, of the Jewish people. And therefore, Vatikach Miriam Achot Aharon, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aharon took, and the Pasuk specifies that she was the sister of Aharon to teach us that she possessed the same midah of Aharon, her brother. She promoted shalom between her parents, between Amram and Yocheved. And as a result, all of the rest of the Jewish people followed suit. All the men took back their wives. And that merit, it was revealed to her from above that her mother would give birth to the Savior. This explains beautifully why HaKadosh Baruch Hu's statement to Bnei Israel via the prophet Micha, the Pasuk says, Ki he'eliticha me'eretz mishraim u'mibet avadim piditicha, v'eshlach lefanechat Moshe, Aharon u'miriam. For I've taken you out of the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of slaves, and I sent Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam. So what do we see from this Pasuk? It's evidently clear that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent three children to Amram and Yocheved, Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam, to guide Bnei Israel and lead them during the, during the Geulah, during Yesiat Misraim. In fact, the Midrash also says, beautiful, based on the Pasuk in Mishle, Chachmot Nashim Banta Beita, the wisdom of, of women build their homes. And the Midrash tells us, Zu Yocheved, this is in regards to Yocheved, who managed to bring forth and give birth to three tzaddikim. All three of them became providers, not the parnas that we have in shul. They also provide, but we are real providers. Moshe Alaman, Moshe Rabenu provided the man in this week's Berasha. Aharon al Ha'ananim. Aharon was for the clouds, technically also this week's Berasha. Miriam al Be'er. And Miriam for the well. Ushloshtan hayu nevi'im. All of them had prophecy. Uminayin, how do we know they were all prophets? Be Moshe, the Pasuk says, Velo kam navi ol be Israel be Moshe. Be Aaron, it said, Varon achicha ye nevi'echa. That's in Parashat Shemot. Uv Miriam, this week's parasha, batikach Miriam ha nevi'a chot Aharon. So we see that this is the reason why Miriam merited to be part of this triad of nevi'im who guided Bnei Israel and provided for them during the Geulah, during the Exodus, in their journeys throughout the Midbar. She was the Achot Aharon. She was a sister of Aharon. She exemplified that Midah. She was Ohev Shalom Berodev Shalom, evident from the fact that she prevailed upon her father Amram to take Yocheved back as his wife. And the result of that union, Moshe Rabenu, which... The Savior of Am Yisrael, of course, that prompted all of Bnei Israel to remarry their wives. There's another pertinent point here that we want to address. Because of Miriam's convincing argument, we said Amram and Yocheved gave birth to Moshe Rabenu, and all of Bnei Israel produced a generation that was going to leave Egypt, and this generation was that that was going to be privileged to receive the Torah. Now, before the Jewish men separate from their wives. This is what's written in Sefer Shemot. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, One of them was named Shifra, one of them was Pua. And he said, When you assist, the Hebrew women at childbirth, and they're on the birth stool about to give birth. If it is a son, you are to kill him. And if she is, a, if it's a girl, she shall live. And Rashi here introduces us to these two individuals, Shifra and Pua. Shifra is Yocheve because she beautifies the newborn child. And Pua is Miriam, a name that indicates that she would cry, speak, and coo the, the newborn child in a manner that women or mothers would soothe the baby. Um, and they would keep and they would keep the baby boys alive by supplying them with water and food. So what can we suggest? In the merit of their own self-sacrifice 
defying Paro's orders to kill the newborn babies, males, Miriam fulfilled the dictum of mitzvah goreret mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. By defying Paro, she merited influencing her father Amram and the other men of Israel to take their wives back. It didn't apply to Yocheved, who also was one of the midwives, because Yoch- the, the, the Chachamim tell us in Masech Brachot, En Havush Matir Atzmo, a prisoner doesn't release himself, because Yocheved was one who was already divorced. She, she had no ability to convince her husband to take her back, because her husband's going to say, well, listen, uh, you know, you are, you, are, you are part of it. You know, I need someone from the outside, an unbiased opinion. You're biased. So seeing as Amram separated from her, she required Miriam to prevail upon her dad, upon Amram, to convince him. And as a reward for her own self-sacrifice, um, Yochevitz, that is, she was privileged to give birth to Moshe Rabbeinu. So now we can explain why Miriam Neviah merited singing a song on her own in this week's Perasha, independent of the men. Due to her nevia, due to her nevua, her prophecy, her father and all the men returned to their wives at the incredible, most unbelievable, amazing, inspiring miracle to ever take place on earth, Kriyat Yamsuf, orchestrated by Moshe Rabenu. The veracity of her nevua was confirmed. Moshe Rabenu was indeed the savior of Am Yisrael, and because of that, she merited to sing her own song. It was her own song. Why all of the women were privileged to join Miriam in singing this shira? They had already prepared this celebration, like we said at the beginning of the shiur, by taking their instruments and tambourines out of Egypt. You know, the righteous, like we said, we quoted Rashi, these tzadkaniyot were so sure that God would perform miracles for them that they took out the entire orchestra with them to dance and sing. The Gemara Masechet Sota, similar in the, uh, to what we quoted before in the same, uh, nearby, in Yud Aleph Amud Bet says, Bishar nashim tzadkaniyot she'ayu be'oto ador in the merit of those righteous women who were in that generation, Nigalu Yisrael mi Misraim. B'nei Yisrael were redeemed from Egypt. Lish of Mayim, when they would go and draw water, what would God do? Amazing miracle. HaKadosh Baruch Hu mezamen lahem dagim ketanim bekaddehem. That God would prepare small fish for them in their jugs. They would draw up jugs that were half full of water and half full of fish. Then they would come and place two pots. One pot of hot water, one pot of fish. And then they would take their husbands into the field. Umarchitot otam and bathe them. Vesachot otam and anoint them. Umachilot otam and feed them. Umashkot otam and give them to drink. Veniskakot lahem and join them in a union and cohabit with them. Vekevan shemit abrot baot ebatehem. When they became pregnant, they will come to the houses. Let's not forget that these men were working as slaves all through the day. They came back totally destroyed physically. Unable to move, and what the ladies did for them every single night until they were able to conceive from them. Where did the ladies get this, uh, the, these, uh, the ability to do these actions, this care to be with their husbands during this time? It has to be from Miriam's influence. She was one of the three Nevi'im that guided B'nai Israel in Egypt and in the desert. So upon seeing how Miriam influenced her dad, Amram, and the other husbands to take their wives back at only five years old, and help build Knesset Israel, the congregation of Israel, they also followed her to lead, to prevail upon their own husbands, to fulfill the mitzvah of Peru Urbu, to have children. 
So just as Miriam merited singing her own song, her own shira, after Keriyat Yamsuf, so too did all the righteous women merit to sing with her that song. So, Batikach Miriam Nevia Chot Aaron et Atov Beyada. Miriam Nevia, Aaron's sister, took the tambourine in her hand in the merit of influencing her father to take back her mother. And as a result, all of the men took back their wives. And that's why all of the all of the women followed her. All of the women went with tambourines and dances because they followed her lead. They prevailed upon their own husbands to fulfill the mitzvah peru urvu. Says the Shalak Kados. He notices that the grammar in the Pasuk seems a little bit off. But it says, Vatan lahem Miriam. Miriam called out to them, the ladies. Shiru lahem ki gao gaasus verocherom aramayam. And the commentaries question, why does the text employ the masculine term, Vatan lahem Miriam, rather than the feminine term, Vatan lahen? She's talking to the ladies. It should have been lahen. So says the Shalak Kados that it was the righteous women who believed wholeheartedly in Hashem's salvation, and it was for that reason that they brought the musical instruments and tambourines with them. They demonstrated a level of courage, a level of bravery that was similar, in fact surpassed the characteristic of man. And therefore, the scripture, the narrative applies the masculine terminology, Batan lahem Miriam. That bravery and courage you normally see among the males when they go fight and they're willing to give up their life. This was something that was prevalent with the ladies right now at this moment. Miriam felt like she was talking to males. Vatan lahem Miriam. That's a beautiful shot of the Shela Kadosh. I want to go a little bit deeper with you tonight, as we like to do on our Thursday night class. And try to explain why Miriam and the women followed the men with a more exuberant and a more celebratory type of dance and song. Again, we read the Pasuk, Patikach Miriam Nevia Chota Aronet Atof Peyada. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the tambourine in her hand, and the women followed her, and like we said, Rashi, that the righteous women of that congregation, of that generation, were certain that God was going to perform miracles for them, so they took tambourines out of Egypt. Why tambourines? Why that specific instrument? Why why wasn't enough with just a song, as the men did without instruments, without tambourines? So, this is Shabbat Shira, and it's fit that we delve deep into the amazing words again of the Shela Kados. And he presents a fascinating chidush by one of the great Mekubalim, Rabbi Abraham Galanti. And he explains the following He says, There are two evil klipot, two negative influences, negative spirits that can attach themselves to a person and cause him harm, whether it's spiritual harm or physical harm. One of them is called Mahalat Bat Ishmael. Ishmael actually had a daughter named Mahalat. But one of them is called Mahalat. This klipa roams the desert and is accompanied by 478 Bands of destructive angels, which is the numerical value of Mahalat. The other name, the other force, is that called Lilith. Lilith is accompanied by 480 bands of destructive angels, the numerical value of Lilith. Mahalat goes around dancing. Lilith wails. It howls. And there's a lengthy battle that is carried on, that's going on between them. But they don't confront each other, these two negative klipot. 
except for one day of the year that they com- that they confront each other, and this is on Yom Kippur. When their armies face off each other and attack each other in a in a very vigorous and brutal confrontation, whatever this means, I'm not quite sure. But while that's going on, on Yom Kippur, the tefillot of Am Yisrael during their fast are like bypassing all of these klipot and ascending to Shamaim without any prosecution. This is what's happening behind the scenes. This is how Kadosh Baruch Hu gives the tefillot the detour to avoid all the mess on the highway. They just go like this, Yashar to God. The Shira Kadosh explains how we are to abolish these two kelipot. How do we get rid of these negative influences, these external influences? I want to read you what he says. Kitikun leachnia klipot hayem. To rectify or to minimize these klipot. Humitzad asot hatov romez lifaulatam. You have to do something that alludes to their own purpose and action, to what they're known for. So he, he tells us more specifically. In order to minimize and get rid of Lilit, who he has to fast, he has to bring upon himself pain, he has to cry, because Lilit is, like we said, was the howling, was the wailing. So you also have to wail. You also have to cry through fast and tefilot. That's how you get rid of Lilit. Betzar belev achnaa, pain in the heart, humble yourself, bitfila with prayer, shared maot, gates of tears, vaz ichnat lilit. That's how you get rid of lilit. Ulachniat mahalat, to get rid of mahalat, who besimcha shel mitzvah, it's the opposite. You have to act with happiness, a, a, a joy when performing mitzvot. Lismoch be mitzvot, ve lismoch be shabbatot, ve amim tovim. To fill yourself with happiness and simcha and Shabbat and Yom Tov and whatever mitzvah you do, sameach aniim, make the poor people happy, chatam v'chala, bride and groom, lismoach b'yediyat ha-boreu v'asagat k'sat misodotav, b'yediyat shmotav baruch hu b'tfila, knowing God's name, His holy name in tfila. This is how you get rid of, of mahalat. And based on this premise, he interprets two opposing statements of David HaMelech in Sefer Tehilim, one that a lot of people ask, how can David HaMelech say seemingly two opposite things, but you'll see how it makes perfect sense. In the second chapter of Tehilim, David HaMelech says, Ivdu et Hashem serve God with awe and reverence. And in chapter 100, he says, Ivdu et Hashem besimcha, serve God with joy and gladness. And they contradict each other, right? But he says, no, it's necessary to serve God in both ways in order to subdue these two klipot of Mahalat and Lilit. Serving God with yirah, with fear, with awe, reverence, with tears and pain abolishes the howling klipa of Lilit. And when you serve God with simcha, with happiness, that abolishes and counteracts the dancing klipa of Mahalat that goes around dancing in the desert. So comes Yishla Kadosh and he reinterprets this pasuk that we're talking about tonight. Vatikach Miriam Anevia Achot Aaron etatof beyada. Miriam Anevia, the sister of Aaron, took the tof in her hand. Vatetzena kol anashim achareh betupim ubimcholot. Note that the word, that both the words hatof and ubimcholot if you look in the Sefer Torah, are missing the letter Vav. Tof should be spelled Taf Vav Pei. Mecholot should be Mem Chet Lamed Vav Taf, but they're missing the Vavs. They're both missing the Vavs. Alluding to the fact that Miriam and Neviyah and these righteous women that were with her managed to diminish and abolish and annul these two klipot with their kedusha, with their tambourines, with their tupim, they were able to subdue the klipa of Lilit because the gematria of Lilit 480 is the same gematria as the word tof, tambourine, 480. And they also celebrated 
while dancing, bimholot, dancing around in circles to subdue the klipav, mahalat. The same word. Unbelievable chidush. How did Miriam and her entourage extinguish these two klipot? The Megale Amukot on Parashat Vayet Hanan contends that these two negative influences cause mankind to stumble in matters of Kedusha. This is, he writes, the, the hidden significance of the judgment conducted by Shlomo HaMelech in the third chapter of Sefer Melachim. When the two ladies come and argue over the baby, one baby was killed. Unbelievable story, you can read it. Two women innkeepers came to the king and stood before. Shlomo HaMelech, with his incredible Kedusha, was able to subdue these two klipot. These were the two zonot mentioned in the story. When Miriam and her followers came after that Yam Suf being split, we can understand what feat actually took place right over there. According to the Midrash, one of the merits that entitled Bnei Israel to exit Mitzrayim was that they were not immersed in immorality. And that's what the meaning of the Gemara that we cited above in the merit of the righteous women of that generation, Israel was redeemed from Egypt. Their exemplary behavior and their efforts enabled Bnei Israel to safeguard themselves in matters of Kedusha. HaRav Achida in his Sefer Devash Lefi he writes that when a person, a man, marries a woman, a man can sanctify himself and abolish his klipa. When I read you the words that he's going to say now, unreal. Look what he says. Adam isha, when a man marries a woman, nitzol mehaplonit, he is saved from the anonymous one. That's lilit. Shehi gematria pat which is the Gematria 480. Pat also means bread. In Lashon of Halacha, Pat, Pat Pamelach Tochel, Perkei Avod, Pat means bread. You know who also means bread? A woman. Ve'ha'isha nikret lechem. A woman is also called bread. Dichtiv kiren lo ve'yocha lachem. When Moshe Rabbeinu helped the women by the well. And he went on his way afterwards. The ladies came back home and they told Yitro, what happened? Why? Hey, they go, oh, this man helped us. He pushed away all the other shepherds. He removed the rock from the well and he gave the, the sheep to drink. Yitro says, Kiren lo ve'yocha lechem. Bring him, call him back and let him eat bread. And Rashi says, what does it mean let him eat bread? Let him get married. Let him find a suitable partner. And he, and he did marry his wife, Tzipora. And when you get married to a woman, Zochel Torah says the Chida, Shenikret Lechem, which is called also bread. Vezeatam, this is the reason Shamru, the rabbis tell us, Hasharui Belo Isha, Sharui Belo Torah. The Gemara Masechet Yevamot says that an unmarried man lives without Torah. Why is that? Ki aplonit mitabeket bo. You don't have a wife. Somebody else is going to attach to you. And that's the lilit. That's the other pat. That's the other 480. But when you take a woman for a wife, you're saved from the lilit. This is the allusion, the hint. And I will take, and I took pat lechem. We know Pat 480, the same as Lilith. So your choice, you're going to get married to a woman and therefore you're going to save yourself from any other negative influence. Or if you don't get married, you're still going to, you're going to, this, this other Pat is going to stick to you. This, the, the Lilith. It's going to be mitabeket pecha. I'm going to cause you a lot of problems. And you won't be able to have Torah. The Torah doesn't stick when you have the negative influence over there. These are the words of the Chida. So it's precisely for that reason that Miriam and the women who joined her went out to abolish 
those two klipot, how? Betupim ubim cholot. This is why they took the tupim with them, the tambourines with them from Egypt. They were certain that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was going to perform miracles on their behalf. They were certain that they were going to celebrate, not just by shira, not just by singing a nice piyut, but with dancing, with instruments. It was a whole classical ensemble. They were wise enough to understand that in the merit of safeguarding their husbands in the matters of Kedusha, by anointing them, by feeding them, by giving them to drink, by taking them to the fields, by being with them physically so that they could they can conceive and produce the next generation of Jews who are going to witness this Geula, who are going to accept the Torah and Har Sinai. They knew they would succeed in extinguishing those two klipot. Betupim ubim halot. And that's what the Chachamim say. Just like B'nai Israel exited Mitzrayim in the, of the, in the merit of those righteous women, so too Israel continued to be redeemed in every generation in the merit of the righteous women. And this is our lesson. This is two or three Pesukim hiding in this week's Perasha, but have so much meaning, have so much power. I'm looking around tonight here live online. I maybe see one, maybe two ladies listening. But this is something that the ladies should feel proud of. What Miriam was able to accomplish from the moment she was just five years old, right away to right till the end of her life. The be'er, the water came as, as her result. What gave her that strength? What gave her that ability to convince and influence so many people? It was her insistence, her emunah and akadosh baruch that things were going to be okay. You can even convince your dad when you're five years old if you truly believe it. And as you get older and you start to understand more, that belief gets stronger and stronger, more powerful, more forceful. You could be sunk in the lowest level, in the deepest trench of all slavery. And you can say to yourself, we're getting out of here. And not only are we getting out of here, I'm going to dance, I'm going to bring musical instruments with me. And she managed to convince all of her fellow ladies to do the same thing. And none of the men were able to do that. The men saw it. And they sang a song. It was a beautiful song. So many secrets, so much power. But they didn't dance. They didn't have the instruments. Their emunah was slightly less than that of the ladies. And because of that, they were zocheh to remove those two klipot through their actions. They were zocheh to help B'nai Yisrael leave Mitzrayim. And in every single generation, as the Jews face a galut after galut, their personal galuyot and their communal galuyot, it's through the ladies, the actions, the emunah of the ladies, chachmot nafshim banta beita, is what leads us through the way and helps us move along. Wishing everybody a wonderful night. Shabbat shalom vevorach. Be well.